All right. Woohoo! Pair your process. How exciting is this? How many emails do I have in my inbox right now where people are saying, Dr. Anderson, your review is late. Where is your review? You said you would review this paper. And then I say, sorry. And then they go, okay, when can you do it? And then I say, eh, maybe the next week. And they go, okay. And then I don't do it next week and they get angry with me. <laughs> so you should not be as lame as I am. But um, basically what the peer review process is, is not perfect. It's, it's kind of like capitalism or whatever, right? It's like, it's the worst system out there except for all the other ones we've tried kind of thing, right? So, uh, but what it does is it guarantees some minimum level of confidence that this stuff isn't totally BS from the get-go. Do not confuse peer review with perfect, okay? We are all humans, we all make mistakes. Um, but again, it provides a minimum level of academic rigor. Way better than just about, you know, m than most you know, political communication, than just about everything out there, but still it's not perfect. Um, in addition to just providing that, that minimum level of academic rigor, it acts to standardize the way we communicate. So those sections I just told you about, the formats, the conventions, it, 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 we double check each other and we go, no, dude, you, you know, that's not how we format it, we do it this way. And it acts to make our, our language and our, and our media consistent. And then especially for you guys, when you're starting out, it actually helps your writing. Now, some reviewers are jerks, right? But most, most, when they see that you are just submitting this, as, you know, it's your undergrad, I just submitted this undergrad paper, most folks don't go, this is the worst thing ever in the world, you, you suck, right? Most people kind of take a look at you, kind of can tell that you're a new writer, and let me give you a little more, let me give you some more detail. Instead of just slashing a line, they'll say, you know, you probably wanted to say it this way. Whereas if it's some old, old ancient dude that's been working in the field forever, like, dude, that you, should, you shouldn't have said it that way. Yeah, that kind of thing. So actually, by going through the peer review process, it makes you a better uh, writer, a better communicator. This is how it works. If, there's, if you're the only one on your paper, it's you, but if there's multiple authors, it's gonna be the first author, also known as the corresponding author. Every once in a while, every once in a while, the first author isn't the corresponding author. So let's say I'm about to go get on a boat and I'm gonna be in Antarctica for six months and basically out of reach. Maybe I would have my second author be the corresponding author. But 99% but of the time, the first author is the corresponding author. So that first author is gonna be in charge of shepherding this thing through. So what's gonna happen? I'm gonna write my paper, I'm gonna show it to all my friends, they're gonna give me feedback, I'm gonna edit it, I'm gonna look at it again, I'm gonna show it to my wife, I'm gonna show it to all these people, you know, da 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 get it to the point where I think it's, it's decent, right? Then I'm gonna find a journal that's a good fit for it, okay? And then I'm, okay, this is a journal, and, I, and each journal will usually have some different, different requirements of how you format it, so I'm gonna put it in the right formatting and everything. Then I'm gonna send it to the journal. Back in the day, you, had to put it in the, you used to have to put it in the mail. Now, everybody, you just upload electronically, upload electronic documents, so submit it, boom, good. Now, it goes to the journal editor. So every journal has an editor. Many of the bigger ones have actually subsections or, or so-called section editors. So the journal editor is gonna get it, boom, okay. Primary filter. This is the journal of dolphin nasal anatomy. Okay, you just gave me a paper on elephant trunk dynamics. Mm, dude, no, you sent the wrong journal. So they're gonna act as a primary filter. Glance at it and just say, is this vaguely something that we're interested in? Assuming it is, and it probably is, then we're gonna send it on. If, if it were to be something different, if it were be to be about elephant trunks, I would send a polite letter back, thank you, Dr. Blah, 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 for your submission. And looking at it, it looks like this would be better in a pachyderm journal. You know, thank you for considering us. But assuming it make, makes that, passes that uh, uh, preliminary filter that it's appropriate for the journal, that person then passes it on. So that's how I get, a, one of the ways I get a million emails in my inboxes, right? It's like, hey, Dr. Anderson, there's a paper about oil spills. Because you're so smart and whatever, <laughs> and know about oil spills, we want you, would you mind reviewing this for us? And you, it's like, oh geez, really dude? And, and so, so you do it. So the key part here is these referees that do the heavy lifting are not employed by the journal. 
They are not paid by the society, by the journal, by the, the whoever. They're volunteering their time. So one of the reasons I don't feel super bad about taking usually a long time to get my, not all the time, but sometimes taking a long time to get to my, my things is like, is dude, I got all this other stuff. I got to grade your guys' papers. I got to write your lectures. I got to be the chair. I got to do this and that. And then on top of that, I got to do this. So it's considered professional service for our community, right? It makes science better by having people like me do this. So I do it, but they're not, you know, if they gave me a thousand bucks, I, I would do it much more quickly. Right? <laughs> so this summer I reviewed grants for uh, this, this uh, oil spill research funding agency. And uh, in that case, they actually paid me because we had to fly to Washington DC and do stuff. So uh, they can be a bit more, dude, where the hell is your stuff, right? And I'd be like, okay, here it is, because it's, it's, I'm getting paid. But that's the rare exception. Usually you don't get paid for this kind of stuff. Um, okay, so typically it's gonna go to three different people, three different reviewers. Okay, so now I got the paper. So, so now I'm, I'm, I'm the reviewer. Oh, so I said I would review it, go in, download it, check it out. So again, I'm, I'm unpaid. And I'm going to look at the scientific merit, the value, the originality. Are the statistics done correctly? Are, are they knowledgeable about all the important references and, and, and studies in the, in the uh, recent past on this subject? Then I'm going to write a report that's going to go back to the editor. It's going to be, there's going to be two parts of the report. One part is a part just for the editor. The other part is an overall report that both the editor and the author will eventually get. So it'll be everything from, and it you know, depends on how much time and stuff we have, but, but generally it's going to be everything from, dude, this, you misspelled this, this thing's got to be fixed, to, um, hey, this statistics is, these statistics are wrong. I think you, you use this, this statistical test, you probably wanted to do this, or actually this has the assumption of X. This population distribution looks like it doesn't fit that assumption. So you, it was probably, you know, that, that kind of stuff. Detailed down in the weeds, all that jazz including things like the figure. Hey, this figure is hard to read. You need to fix this axis, that kind of stuff. It's going to go back. My notes to the, my notes to the uh, journal editor are only for him or only for her. Included in those recommendations to him or her, I'm going to make one of three calls. One, this paper is sucks. We, you should never publish this paper in this journal. Okay. <laughs> One. Two, um, uh, well, it's, it's pretty good. There's a little couple, little teeny thing here that I've never ever seen a paper where it's completely 100% perfect. There's always some least little slight thing. But we might call it a minor revision. Hey, they just got to fix this one legend on this figure, right? Take them five minutes. We call that except with minor revisions. And then the one that takes most, so usually when the paper sucks, that's pretty easy. Usually when the paper is awesome, that's pretty easy. Most of the work comes into play for this middle value, which is except with revisions. So what that means is, you know, it's a good study here. There's some good stuff. We probably should publish it, but there's some serious things the authors need to fix. And so here they are. And so I would say, except with revisions. They need to redo their statistics. They need to, whatever it is, um, at a minimum to get this published, and then here's a bunch of other things they could also work on. Now the job of the editor is to take my comments and journal re and, and reviewer number two and reviewer number three, and they put them all together. Now hopefully all three of us are in total agreement. All three of us say the exact same thing. That's the best thing. Then the editor doesn't have to do any work. Okay, cool. We'll do that, and then just forwards on our detailed comments to the to the first author and say, dude, fix this. Do what they say. Now, the author can then, uh, you know, the, now the first author can can agree, you know, fix those all things and send it back, or they might they might say, you know what? No, that those guys are wrong, and here's specifically why they're wrong, right? So they can argue the point, but that's the idea, right? And we go back and forth that way, generally just once or twice, but in theory, it could go a long long time. And uh, and so may I resubmit the paper? And that's how it gets published eventually. Is that cool? Questions about that peer review process? The same, roughly the same thing happens for grants, for when we seek to get money from funding agencies. It's a little teeny bit different. 
But, but by and large, that same process, we have independent reviewers that go and evaluate the grants and that say, you know, this and that. Here's the thing that you guys have to understand. The first author does not know who, I mean, the first author obviously knows who the journal editor is, but they don't know who any of the referees are. The referees are anonymous. This is so-called uh, blind review, blind peer review. But the referees usually know who the author is. So something that's growing in popularity is this thing called double blind review, which is when the journal editor goes to send me the paper, he or she is going to suck out the obvious, the obvious identifying things. Take out the people's names, take out the people's institutions and contact info. And so I get it, and it just says, you know, it's paper, you know, here's this and that. Um, now, you know, in, 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 more, <laughs> in more specific fields or, or, or in more detailed stuff, if there aren't a lot of people working there, a lot of times you can kind of figure it out. So I'm going to use CSUCI's new research vessel. I use CSUCI's new research vessel to go out to the Santa Rosa Island thing and study microplastics. Gee, who the hell possibly did that, right? So sometimes you can piece it together, even if it is blind review. But, um, but generally, that's a better thing. And here's why. There, there is bias. As much as m most scientists work really, really hard, they honestly do, to really, truly be objective. The vast, vast majority. But there are the occasional douchebag here or there, right? And so I'll tell you an example. So my, my, um, my postdoctoral advisor is, was a, is a famous dude. He's done way more than I'll ever do for conservation biology and all this great stuff. But um, one day, we were sitting around and I, when I was a postdoc, and, uh, and the, the young postdocs like me were complaining, oh my god, everybody has us, wants us to review these papers, there's so much work, and we don't get paid for it, we have to do all this kind of stuff, but we kind of feel like we have to because we want to get a job afterwards, and you know, all this and that. And, and, uh, and so we're complaining, and then in walks my, my, uh, my postdoc advisor, the grandfather of conservation biology. And, Guy that invented, you know, ecosystem services, the ideas, and all this kind of stuff. And so we're, we're saying, hey, you know, like, what's, what's wrong? What's, what's wrong? And so he said, oh, you know, we're, we're gonna have so much work. And he says, this is a person that I saw go to a bunch of, a bunch of, uh, you know, conferences and say, look, we gotta treat everybody equally. We need to bring, you know, young people into the field and this and that. And he said, <laughs> look, here's the deal. What you do is you look where the paper's from, you know, where the author's from. And, and he used to use this one, I can never remember it, but it was this, he used to always use it. It sounds like a fake name, but it's, it's a real name of a community college, like Podunk Community College in Podunk, Texas or something, right? And, um, and he used it to be derisive. He used it to be, you know, kind of a jerk. And he's like, so look, if you get a paper and it's from Podunk Community College, you better look at the statistics. The statistics are probably wrong. You better really, really <laughs> scrutinize them. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, okay. He's like, but... If you get a paper from Yale, you, you don't need to worry about the statistics because you know they're, they're pretty smart. And I went like, what? <laughs> that that's exactly what I said. I said that's you know blah blah blah. That's totally messed up. We should be there. And and the answer was, uh, well, do you want to be, <laughs> you know, do you want to have principles? Or do you want to be done with the stuff quickly? And I was like, what? Do you part of the problem? And then we kind of had a thing. But anyway, so um, <laughs> but but the point is double blind. Even though that's, I think that's relatively rare. It definitely happens, but it's relatively rare. But double blind avoids that, right? Because you can't tell necessarily where it's from, so you need to review everything with hopefully an equal, more fair assessment. Another small thing, just before we leave this, just to, again, be realist here, uh, there are some people that are petty. <laughs> So what you can do when you're submitting this report is if you've been having a turf battle with, with some other scientists and you've been having some argument, uh, you can say anytime you submit a grant, anytime you submit a paper, hey, you know what? You can send it to whoever you want, but please don't send it to anybody from this lab. And that's totally legit. People do that not all the time, but it, it's a fairly common thing. So if you felt that somebody's biased against you, that they have it in for you, 
I won't, I won't say an example on, on, on this recording, but you can ask me examples later. If they have it in for you, right, it's just like, you know what, I, we don't even want to go there, right? Let's just say, leave those folks out of it, and, and we'll go on, right? So, so that, 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 is, that is a legitimate thing. So if you're having a throwdown with some, some person from the park service, right, and they're the expert in Tory Pines or something, and you think they're biased against you, and you wanted to publish this, you could say, hey, journal, please don't send it to this office or anybody or this, this person kind of thing. And that, that's your right. That's your right. Cool? Cool. Any questions about peer review? Yeah. So is this something that you have to pay for? Like if you want to... Oh, good question. Journal, you have to pay money. So the question is you have to pay for this. It depends. Many journals, no. Some journals, yes. Ironically... Uh, many of the ones that you guys like, the open source journals, those are oftentimes the ones you do have to pay for because they don't have a society with them. So, yeah, okay, so to be clear, how this, the, the kind of bizarro world of academic peer review. So I, I submit my, jur my article that, that maybe I've funded with, with public dollars, your guys' tax dollars, maybe funded my research, right? I do my work. I, I analyze it, I write it up, I, write, I, I submit it, get it in. Now it's in this journal for some society that everybody that did the heavy lifting is all volunteering. All the reviews, those folks all volunteered their time, right? Now it's up there, but I want to read it. Oh, now you got to pay 30 bucks to read it, right? So there was reasons for that back in the day, right? These were societies, and it cost them money to print these physical items, right? And so they had, there was some cost associated with that, right? So you got to pay for it. Increasingly, with electronic publishing, the costs have gone down and down and down and down. However, some entities, like Elsevier is a classic, publishes lots of journals, they, they want you to pay them, right? It's unclear what this, that service is. But there's clearly some service. You got you to pay for the computers. You got to host the server. So with the, with the open source journals, a lot of them you have to you might have to pay. Almost all of them have a clause in there that says, "Hey, if you're a starving graduate student, if you're from a developing country, you know, let us know, and either we can knock the fee down or we can help out in some way, shape, or form." Not all, but most will do that. But the idea is, um, sometimes you don't always have to pay. Sometimes you do. I don't think I've ever, have I ever published in a journal I had to pay for? I don't think so. I have to think about that. Um, I'm not sure, but probably not. Maybe, no, maybe, no, maybe. Maybe this one that we're doing just now, I think maybe it was like 30 bucks or something, some small amount. But generally speaking, I don't, I don't pay people to, to publish my stuff. Okay, other questions? Awesome, awesome. So before we leave, before we break, I want to do a little bit, now this is not like full writing, but let's talk, talk a little bit about this idea of review, revise, 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 right? For next week, again, you guys are giving me your first 10 references, okay? So that's what's due, that's due next week, printed paper, your name, title, etc. So you're working on, you're not writing yet, we're not writing yet, we're, we're working on getting stuff together, but it's going to come along pretty quick. So let's look at this. Here is, now... Revising takes place with writing, but it also takes place with our visual side of communication. One of the key goals for us in your uh, ESRM career and your capstone is to be a better communicator of quantitative information in whatever form that takes. So let's have a look at this graph. I want you guys to stare at this graph for a second and then tell me what you think this graph is, is, is trying to tell us or what it's, what it's saying to us. Okay, better or worse? Definitely better. Okay, check, let's let's start with that access thing you guys talked about. So here we go. So here it, it's much cleaner, much easier to read. We now have the the access labeled, and not 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 just what the thing is, you know, what what, what the, the the subjective of of the data is it being displayed here, but the actual units in which it was quantified. Right. This is cubic meters. We got volume, right? So. Okay. So then, but then the t a more descriptive, and this is division. This is the division. And what is it? A more descriptive title? Volume of mascot right. costumes of all minor league baseball teams, a total of 42, in the United States in 1999. Yeah? We then say, oh my, and then, wh why was all this, now, 
maybe the color mattered if our next graph had a map and we wanted the different colors to map. Yeah. Maybe that would make sense. But not knowing that, if that wasn't the case, why would we add additional colors that just add more confusion to the thing? So in this case, we kept a single color. And then we said, hey, these bars represent the mean, meaning the top of the bar is the average of all the, of all the costume volumes from, the, in this case, the central division. And then plus one standard deviation, so plus one measurement of variance. So now we can actually interpret it, right? Now, okay, I got it. This is, this is the size, the volume of these costumes for this one type of athletic uh, conference. And now because we know what these things are, we can kind of say, you know, probably the West Coast and Central, um, probably not that significantly different in terms of costumes. Some go on the East Coast. The East Coast are significantly smaller. Maybe, maybe the West Coast has a bunch of balls and bulls. And the East Coast is more like, you know, human-shaped costumes that are smaller or something. But you can't tell because you've got 42 baseball teams. It could be one baseball team on the West Coast and 30 on the East Coast. And okay, then, right, sure, okay. And then your West would be, like, Sure, giant. okay, to be, to be sure, right, yeah. So probably should use standard error. There's other things we can use. We could include the, the sample size for each of these bars. Yeah. Agreed. Just like everything else, we can continue to revise this, continue to make it tighter, continue to make it better. But this would be the first step. Like, this is like a first pass. Let me, let me see if I can fix this. And that's how you guys should be doing this stuff, whether it's your writing, whether it's your, whether it's your, uh, uh, you know, what have you. Make sense? That's one example. Let's do one more before we break. Now, these skills that we're talking about will serve you guys throughout your life, right? Increasingly, our society is hoping that you're stupid. Oh, yeah. And I mean that literally. They are counting on you being poor consumers of information. They are counting on you being stupid, non-critical evaluators of information that's in the world. And they're getting bolder and bolder. So here's an example. Um, and this is from, uh, this is a real example from, in this case, the Wall Street Journal. And this is an op-ed. Um, I tried to pick an example that wasn't an ESRM example so we could not get bogged down in the specifics. But so here we go. So this is an op-ed and exerting in this excerpt this is from 2011. This excerpt says, President Obama asked the wealthiest Americans to pay a little more. But then this, the argument goes in this, in this piece, the mathematical reality is that Washington will need to soak the middle class because that's where the big money is. So, so the argument is that the president wanted to tax wealthy folks, but the reality was he's not going to tax the wealthy folks. He's going to tax the average Joe. And so here's that same graph, just blown up. So stare at this graph and tell me, tell me if this graph supports the argument that is being offered or does not. It, it kind of proves that most of the taxpayers are in a certain Section, but then there's that one. Okay, okay, so Steve says, yeah, so it, at least at first glance, it looks like it supports it, right? Because they're saying that, so, so the argument is that, hey, this guy says that the taxes are going to be addressed at the wealthy end, but the, uh, the argument is saying, actually, it's going to hit the middle class people. Check it out. The graph lumps up in the middle, in the middle zone, right? So that looks like it, it looks like it supports their argument. Anything wrong with that? Okay, so Finn says, look at the axis. Yeah, I mean, from 100,000 to 200,000, that's going to include a lot of people. So the axis is massively intentionally deceptive. Yeah. The axis is designed to fool you. The axis is designed to have you look at the distribution, right. see these big tall bars, and not look closely down here. Check it out. This 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 bar is one to five thousand dollars. This bar is five to ten million dollars. That is not how you honestly, objectively present data. This is an attempt to obfuscate, confuse, and actively mislead. One might even say be propaganda, but I wouldn't want to say that. Then you look at the source. So let me re-graph this for you. The way it 
you can graph it in many ways. Here's a simple way to graph it. The quintiles. So this is an even spacing of the, in this case, the, the amount of sh potentially taxable income. So a little bit with the poorest folks, a little bit more. The, so the biggest chunk is indeed the wealthiest folks. Now, I'm not trying to pass any judgment whether we should or shouldn't do this. But the argument was made that this policy, right or wrong, would disproportionately attack these dudes. That is not true at all. So people are counting on the fact that you are a sucky grapher, that you are a sucky interpreter of data, and, and, and have the huevos to throw it in your face. The skills that you'll pick up as you become better graphers, better writers, you can apply to be a better citizen, to be a better consumer of information, not just in ESRM stuff, but in, in stuff more widely. Make sense? Mm -hmm. All right, cool.